Done with the meat. So, because our section was, you know, like they, they, they kind of, when you go to Texas Day Brazil or one of the places with the, where they bring the meat over, like they seat it in areas. And so that way they know all these people descend like smart bombs bringing you the meat and they keep bringing you the meat. And they know like after 15 or 20 minutes of dumping that meat on you, normal people are done. Yeah. And so they move on to the next section that's getting seated. Well, we're all green and we're sitting there with empty plates and it's Sunday brunch and like the tables are full and like they're wanting to turn them and like the manager comes over and he goes, do y'all need some more? And we're like, yes. And they're like, well, what do you want? And we're like, we want lamb. We want beef. We want, we want it all. We're hungry. We want more. And so they had to come, they, they came with a whole nother wave of meat and we were glad because there were meats that we didn't get the first time. They like held back the good stuff for the later crowd. We're like, yeah, that's ribeye. Yeah, that's filet. So we ate and we ate and we ate enough that like I went home and like, you know, you're in pain. I had the meat sweats, you know, I'm sitting there just trying to like make it through because you overindulge to the point. Anybody ever done that? Like you think about a Thanksgiving, you know, you gotta like find the right position to sit, you know, because you ate too much and you, you can't just, you know, yeah, we went all out. So I would have figured like, if I was ever gonna do damage to my intestine, it would have been that. But no, no, all of that was fine. All of that was fine. I get home, I get back on my diet. I'm eating protein shakes and, you know, little tiny meals and all of a sudden Saturday night rolls around and I just have the worst bloating pain that I've ever had in my stomach. I mean, just brutal. It was just awful. And I was up all night, couldn't sleep, terrible pain. And I just figured maybe by, you know, hopefully by morning it'll be over. It wasn't. Sunday morning, I was still in a lot of pain. You know, and I'm just dealing with it because I'm like, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to go to the emergency room. You know, it's the weekend. And I'm looking at these emergency room waiting times on my phone. And I'm like, I'm not sitting in a hospital for two hours. Forget it. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer on my easy, on my lazy boy. You know? And so finally, I watched the, the wait times were dropping and my pain was going up. And I felt like the Lord was telling me. Now's the time. So I went over there to Methodist Germantown. And sure enough, I had a blockage in my small intestine. You know, all the way up, like close to your stomach. I had this called small bowel obstruction. It was totally blocked. And so I spent a week in the hospital while they waited on that thing to clear. I was in the hospital from Sunday all the way till Friday. And it finally cleared up. I didn't have anything... I couldn't have any food or even water by mouth from Sunday to Thursday. Mm. Nothing. I was on an IV. They had like this tube down my nose into my stomach, constantly like just sucking air and like just waiting just to make sure nothing hit my bowel at all. Nothing would hit it just so that it would just be intestines could totally rest, which is not pleasant. As you're laying there and your throat's dry, you want water. You're like, water, water. And they're like, no. No water for you. You got the IV, you know. <laughs> it's just like, but I want water. And I remember when they finally lived, it was like all I wanted. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want it. I wasn't hungry. I just wanted water. It's all I wanted. And I was so happy when I had cold water for the first time. So anyway, they sent me home. And uh, they got me right now on this uh, restricted diet. Uh, basically, no fiber, no vegetables. Nothing that could uh, get trapped in there. Apparently fiber, when you have an obstruction, is not your friend. Which I would have, you know, after years of being yelled at for not eating enough vegetables, I finally, a doctor's like, hey man, you can't have spinach when you go home now. And I was like, oh, that's uh, unfortunate, you know. Yeah. But I got an appointment tomorrow with a specialist. I still got some pain, still hard to eat, but uh, you know, there's still something going on. I don't know if it's gonna go away by itself or you know what. I'm glad to be out of the hospital though. Cause you know, you're just sitting there kind of waiting. They don't really, they don't do a whole lot in a hospital except just kind of sit and see if you're gonna get worse or not. And it's not like, you know, they do all these tests and like really get to the bottom of it. So hopefully tomorrow I'm gonna see somebody and uh, get some tests and figure out, you know, what if anything needs to be fixed. Hopefully it goes away on its own. You know, Lord willing, it'll just heal, and they'll be like, well, you just need a little more time, and it'll be all right. But, uh, yeah, that was painful, I will tell you. I'm glad you're all right, brother. I'm glad, too. 
I am very happy that it is over with. Did you go to the one in the shower? No, we went to uh, we went to Fogo to Chow in Rosemont. Oh, Rosemont. Yeah, the Texas Day Brazil is in Schaumburg. The Fogo to Chow is uh, in Rosemont. They had a sun. Yeah, it's over there. There's all there's a couple of casinos now. They built that whole area up. So that was a survey of my last three weeks, and I have missed you guys very much. I am glad to be back. And if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Jude. Jude is the last book before Revelation. So if you turn to the book of Revelation, Jude is just before Revelation. It's only like a page. So it's easy to miss if you're, you know, flipping. So the easiest way to find it is to go to Revelation, turn one back. It's a good book. And it's a short book. It's more like a letter. I don't know that you, I don't know that you could call it a book. It's right. They, they don't even have chapter numbers. If you notice, when I wrote up here, June 24 and 25, that's because all there are are verses. There's no chapters. So that's right. If somebody says, turn your Bibles to Jude 2. They mean Jude chap Jude verse 2. That's all there is. There is no chapter. So anyway, Jude is a letter that was written by one of Jesus' half-brothers. So he's related to James, and which is another one of Jesus' half-brothers. So we've got two letters in the New Testament that were written by the brothers of Jesus. And I say half-brothers because Joseph, while being Jesus' earthly father, was not his father-father because of the Immaculate Conception, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. And so they are brothers. They grew up together. And James and Jude are the two brothers of Jesus that we have letters from. And interestingly, during their ministry, during Jesus' ministry, they were not believers walking around. They were not the disciples. You know, when you look at Jesus' 12 disciples, they're not his brothers. And you would think for sure that those would be but, you know, they grew up with Jesus. And so while I'm sure they knew that there was something different, there was nothing, something special, it took the resurrection before they fully came over. And so Jude is a letter written to the church that is warning them about corruption that's creeping into the church. And it's warning them about who they need to be on the lookout for. Jude is seeing these wolves that Jesus warned about and said, you know, beware because there are these wolves that appear like sheep in sheep's clothing. And so Jude is talking about these wolves that have crept into the church that are there and that are engaging in deceit, that are engaging in harm, that are doing bad things inside the church blaspheming the name of Jesus and bringing people and leading them astray. And that's very valuable for us because we are in an era where the church has a lot of corruption that has crept in. More and more we see churches that are falling away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ, that are falling away from standing on the word of God. Often we see these churches that are just a little bit you know, nervous about quoting something too heavily. You know, and they don't want to be too literal. And that's very dangerous because we have these churches that, you know, now, today, just like we did back then, are becoming places where the word of God is not being preached with the same passion. You know, in, um, in 2013, the Presbyterian Church, they were updating their hymnal, you know, and there's a song in Christ Alone. You all know it, the Gettys and Christ alone, hope is found. Well, there's this line in there about the wrath of God being satisfied as Jesus hung on the cross, because that's the word of God. And the Presbyterians came and said, you know, we like your song, it's huge. But, you know, that, that line right there is a little bit too aggressive. You know, we don't want to talk about the wrath of God. We just want to talk about the love of God. And they wanted to change the lyrics. They wanted permission to adjust the lyrics. 
And the Gettys said, no, we can't do that because we're standing on the word of God. And our song is talking about the word of God. It's talking about the fact that there is wrath, that when we are separated from God, when we don't know God, that one day if we refuse to accept Jesus as our savior, that there will be the wrath of God, that there is punishment that has to be atoned for. And only the blood of Christ can do it. And we can't strip that out of our song because it might be the most important part of the song talking about the saving blood of Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross. We can't take that out. And so the Presbyterians didn't put the song in their hymnal. And you hear stories like that and that's scary because it's that little bit of corruption that creeps in that can be very dangerous. Jesus talked about the leaven creeping in. A little leaven, a little bit of yeast spoils the whole batch. It doesn't take a lot for the devil to get you going in the wrong direction. I mean, everybody's in here Everybody in here has got a problem with alcohol, drugs, something. But I'm willing to bet that if you look back at the first time that you decided to experiment or try something, you never would have thought that that one little experiment, that one little sampling, that one first beer, that one illicit drug that you took that first time would have ever brought you to this point here. Seemed harmless enough. I'll just try a little. Yeah, why not? I'm out with friends. It's a party. What could be the harm? But yet, slowly but surely, that one little bad decision led to a slightly bigger bad decision, which led to a bigger bad decision and a bigger bad decision and a bigger, and they snowballed like dominoes. Until one morning, you wake up, you look in the mirror, and you wonder how it's possible that you made so many bad decisions in a row that you're facing the situation that you're facing now. That's how the devil works, a little bit at a time. He knows he can't talk you into jumping off a bridge. I mean, if he whisper, you'd be like, nah, you're crazy. But a little bit at a time, he gets you closer to that cliff. And then before you know it, you're standing on the edge and you don't even know how you got there. And you don't even know what to do. And that's okay because you're here now, praise God. Amen. Praise God that you have been rescued from that moment. Amen. And there's no shame in having experienced that moment. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And your sin is no worse than anybody else's sin. Don't ever let anybody make you feel like it is. You know, it's easy for people in nice houses to look like they got it all together. And they'll look down on people. But in the meantime, love has grown cold in their home sometimes. Sometimes they're just hiding their problems. But we all have sin. We all struggle. We all need Jesus. And so Jude writes to this church. And I'll start here. I'll just open up with verse. We'll start with verse one. And he says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. That's my prayer for you tonight. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. May you read your Bibles. May you pray to Jesus. May you walk with the Lord and may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. May you feel the love of Jesus. May you feel his mercy. May you feel the peace of knowing that you are forgiven if you know Jesus. That there is no judgment before the Father. That he will allow you before his holy throne. Blameless in the name of Jesus. And he goes, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend earnestly for the faith. Justin talked about the fact that our walk with the Lord is a relationship and we have to work on it. No different than you have to work on a relationship with your girlfriend, with your friends, with your spouse, with your parents. You know, any relationship is, a, is what you put into it. You know, if you want to be good friends with someone, you got to spend time with them. 
You got to talk to him. That's true of God too. God will give you as much of him as you want. Jesus stands ready to have the closest possible relationship that you could ever imagine. He is ready to spend as much time with you as you desire. Think about that. The creator of the universe is willing to give you 24-7 access. He will allow you before the holy throne of God the Father. And the only limiting factor on how much time you spend with God, the only limiting factor on how close your relationship is with God, the only limiting factor on how much time you can dwell with the Holy Spirit is your decision into how much time you want to spend with him. Do you want to spend five minutes with him in the morning? Well, then your relationship will be a five-minute relationship. Like one of those quickie devotionals you read, the drive-by, the word of the day on the radio. You know, you hear that, you got a little word of the day, hey, word of the day, cheer you up, great. You got a little nugget, okay. If that's all the Jesus you want, that's sad. Because that means the devil's going to be spending a lot of time whispering in your ear. You're going to be out there alone. Yep. But if you say, no, I want a lot of Jesus. You know what? The devil doesn't want to be anywhere near that. He's not going to come into the presence of the Lord. He's not going to come near where God is dwelling. Paul writes that our body is a temple. He talks about training like the athlete, purifying his body. Our body is a temple where the Holy Spirit resides. If your temple is sanctified and holy, the devil's not going to be anywhere near that. He's going to be busy going after somebody he can take down. Flaming arrows don't stand a chance against the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes on, he says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Perverting the grace of Jesus, saying, well, hey, it's all paid for, so we may as well indulge. There are those out there that go, well, Jesus has paid for my sins, so I may as well continue to sin. <clears throat> And there's a lot of people out there like that. They talk about the grace of Jesus, the love of Jesus, but you look at their life and go, I don't see you acting like Jesus. Our pastor's fond of saying, if there's no root, there's no fruit. And what Jude is saying here is that if you've got somebody that's talking about the fact that, oh, Jesus paid it all, let's live it up till our number's up, as Lenny used to say. Are they really saved? Do they really know Jesus? Because if you know God, you want to serve God. You want to walk with God. And there's no way to walk humbly with the Lord God Almighty and to serve God and to continue to enjoy sinning. No more than you can put a light in a dark room and not have the light make an impact. They're not compatible. And he goes on, he says, I desire to remind you of certain things. And he brings up three examples from the Old Testament. The Israelites that were delivered out of Egypt that were subsequently destroyed because they did not believe. And they built, there was a calf. And there were some others that were swallowed up in the ground. And there were some others that died in the desert. And they were all stiff-necked. And a whole generation died out in the desert. Because while they experienced and saw the delivering power of God, they chose not to wholly submit to God. It's amazing that you can witness a miracle and still not believe. Believe. 
And I'm sure that there are people in this room that have been in situations where it was so desperate, so hopeless, that maybe you caught yourself praying, Lord, if you'll just deliver me from this moment, I'll do this. And you make a promise. And the Lord delivers you out of that moment. And a week later, you're thinking about that promise you made, and you're like, ah, did I really promise that? <clears throat> the miracle didn't have the lasting impact that you would think it would did. It's amazing how that works. Jesus talks about it too in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. <clears throat> When he asks somebody, when he asks them to send Lazarus to warn his brothers, and he says, Well, your your brothers have the prophets. They have the law. If they won't believe, they're not going to believe somebody else. You know, right now we could the Lord could call down fire from heaven and thunder into the sky and say, I am here. And you need to repent and believe. And on the news they'd be talking about an atmospheric disturbance, which created a hallucination, people would be explaining it away. If they don't want to believe, they're not going to believe. Jesus helped countless blind people see. You would think they would be you know, next to him no matter what. But as he went to that cross, he went alone. He did more miracles than could be recorded in the Gospels, it says at the end. It's so many that there'd be no way to write them all down, not just the ones that are recorded. And yet when he went to the cross, he went alone. <clears throat> you would think that the paralyzed that were able to walk, the blind that were able to see, the deaf that were able to hear, would cry out and go, no, he's a holy man. But yet miracle after miracle after miracle, they still were afraid and fell away. Because ultimately it's about submitting to the Lord and desiring. It's spiritual miracles that we need. And then he goes on to talk about the angels that broke the, that fell, and Sodom and Gomorrah and their immorality. And then in verse 10 he says, But these men revile the things which they do not understand, the things which they know by instinct like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Just like the Presbyterians denying the need for the blood. I want to offer up a fruit basket. They don't want to give their best. They don't want to atone. They want to do what they want to do. Even if that means killing someone. The error of Balaam. Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament that was willing to change his prophecy for a dollar. It's like, no, I can't change it. And the king said, what if I give you some more money? It's like, well, yeah, I could definitely, I could take a look at that again. So he profaned the word of the Lord that he had been given for money. We see that a lot. The love of money is the root of evil. Money's not evil. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't call money evil. He calls the love of money evil. That's why some people can be rich and still love the Lord and get into heaven and be fine. Because they don't love money, they love God. And they're glad to share the abundance that the Lord has given them. Just like the parable of the man that goes away and he gives five bags of silver to one guy two bags of silver to another guy and one bag to the last one. The guy with five turns it into ten. The guy with two turns it into four. And the guy with one buries it in the dirt. The master comes back and the guy with five, he, he turns it into ten. He says, I'm going to give even more. Same with the guy with two that turns it into four. And the guy with one, he goes, what's wrong with you? You could have at least put it in the bank and gotten some interest. And he takes the bag and he gives it to the guy that has ten. It says, because you've done so well and you've been responsible, I will give you even more abundance. It's interesting that he is willing to reward the guy that has the most and give him even more. 
because that's the guy that is responsible with it in stewardship to the Lord. <clears throat> Money's not evil, but the love of money is. And then the rebellion of Korah, the priest that wanted to change it up and do the way he wanted, stood against the word of God and was struck down for it. These men are those who are hidden reefs of your love feasts. They feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars from the black darkness has been reserved forever. So he gives these examples from nature of what these unbelievers are like, and they're unstable. James talks about the man that is double-minded, being tossed around like waves of the sea. That's the thing, is when you're not fully committed to Jesus, you're unstable. You might be talking about Jesus some of the time, but yet the rest of the time, you're doing what you want to do. Tossed around. And your sins are constantly foaming up like churning water. You can't hide them. Because you're not the real deal. And the real deal is the only deal. We'll skip to verse 17. But now he tells us how we defend ourselves against these false teachers. It's a blueprint for us. He goes, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. Jesus says that in the last times, love will grow cold. You know, as I look around today and I see more and more hatred, I see more and more anger, more and more willingness to ignore needs, I see love growing cold. Oh, no, that's just a scam. I'm not going to help that person. Prejudging things, looking at them, always bitter and jaded. In, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Amen. Building yourselves up on the most holy faith. Read your Bible. Build yourself up by reading the word of God, praying in the Holy Spirit. Famous preacher was once asked, what's more important, reading the Bible or praying? And he looked at, looked at him and he said, well, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? Spurgeon, they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand, reading your Bible and praying to God and praying the word of the Lord back to God. The answer to all of your needs is in the word of the Lord. And pray the answer to God. God is faithful. God is able. God is our healer. He is our redeemer. He is our savior. He is our protector. If you need protection, then pray for his protection. Claim it in the name of Jesus. If you need healing, claim it. Pray the word of the Lord back to him. And in doing so, you will keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Have mercy on one another. Amen. Love one another. You know, Jesus said that <clears throat> this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down one's life for his friends. Rescue others. Have mercy on others. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. It's impossible not to stay in the love of God when you love those who curse you. When you pray for those who mistreat you. Because they're not the ones mistreating you. They're not the ones cursing you. It's the sin in them. It's the devil inside of them. The sin that is leading them astray. And when I see somebody that curses me or curses the gospel, it doesn't make me mad. It breaks my heart to know that they're trapped in sin and they don't even know what they're doing. Just like I once was. Just like you once were. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, praise God, Jesus is able to keep you from stumbling. If you're struggling with alcohol, if you're struggling with drugs, if you're struggling with gambling, if you're struggling with reconciling with your family, thinking about, baby, I'm going to go do this or I'm going to do that, know that God is able to keep you from stumbling. He will hold you up with his righteous right hand. And to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy. Amen. He is able to make you stand in the presence of his glory with great joy. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be on my mouth. He said that in the presence of the greatest enemy that he had. King Abilamech. The Philistines. He had slaughtered their heroes and he was standing before the greatest enemy he had. And as he stood before the guy that would have loved to have executed him in the moment where it must have looked the most helpless, the first thing he thought was, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth because God was able to have him stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. I don't care what circumstances you're in. I don't care what problems you are having. God is able to keep you from stumbling and to put you in the presence of his glory with joy. If you call upon the name of the Lord, he will answer you. He will uphold you. He will not abandon you. In Isaiah, he says, fear not. For I have summoned you by name. You are mine. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Jesus is able to keep you from stumbling. Jesus is able to keep you from falling back. Jesus is able to provide you with fullness of joy. He is able to do all things. Paul wrote to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that we would rejoice in the Lord at all times because he is able to guard our hearts and our minds. All day long, we're going to encounter struggles. We're going to encounter problems. We're going to encounter moments where we want to step backwards, where we want to do the wrong thing, where we're going to experience temptation. Or Satan is going to whisper in our ear. Those are the moments more than any other in the day where the first thing you should want to do is pray. Soon as you hear it in your ear, as soon as you hear it in your mind, call upon the name of the Lord. Say, dear Jesus, help me right now. Help me. Because I'm about to do something wrong. 
Help me, Jesus. And just quote a verse in your heart. Read the word of the Lord back. Resist the devil and he will flee. It's amazing how quickly a word from the Bible can reorient your heart and your thinking. You just have to decide that you want to call upon him. You just have to decide that you want to do it. Because he is able to make you stand in the presence of the glory of God with full joy. Let's pray. Almighty King, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for tonight. Oh God, thank you for the Warrior Center. Lord, thank you for a place where spiritual renewal is possible. Almighty Father, Heavenly King, Abba, Lord, I pray that you would put a hedge of protection around this place, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would give your angels charge concerning the Warrior Center, Lord. That you would bind the enemy from this place, Lord, that you would send him away. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would pour your Holy Spirit out upon this place, Lord, that you would bind and destroy from this building anxiousness and fear and doubt, Lord, and that you would replace it with mercy and joy and peace. Lord, I pray that you would multiply the joy and the mercy and the peace inside this room, Lord. Almighty Father, I pray tonight that if there is someone here who doesn't know you, that tonight would be the night. That tonight with our heads bowed, that this would be the moment where they decide to surrender at long last to you. To obey and to call upon you. Lord, I pray with our heads bowed that if there's someone who doesn't know you, that they would just pray, Dear Lord, I am a sinner. I've broken your laws. And I know that I'm separated from you. And so tonight, Jesus, I am asking you to forgive me. I am acknowledging you as my Savior, that you died on a cross for me and that you rose again and that you are alive. <clears throat> and I am surrendering to you now and forever. I don't even know where to begin, Lord, but I know that you can help me. So, Jesus, I'm just asking you to take my hand and show me the way. And wherever you lead, I will walk. A step at a time. A day at a time. Oh Lord, I pray that we would all hunger for you this week. That we would desire to spend time with you above everything else. In the matchless name of Jesus, the Messiah, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.